prayer of our hearts, that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours, that we would give everything we have for your kingdom's cause, that you would show us how to love as we have been loved by you. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A very, very warm welcome from my side and thank you for joining us this morning as we continue our love series very aptly on this Valentine's Day. We've looked the last few weeks at um, probably not the most revolutionary concept and, yes, and yet it is so profound and eternity shaping. This concept that we are loved by God and we've been digging into what that really means for us and the way that we live in the world. You may have been singing Jesus loves me, this I know since you were three years old. But we really hope and pray that over the last couple of weeks, a fresh reality of what that means has crystallized for you. We started by looking at the fact that God is love. It is the essence of who he is and how he reveals himself to us. And then we spoke about John 3.16, the object of God's love, how deep and wide and all-encompassing it really is. Last week, Craig spoke about the cost of love. And Jesus calls us to love others as God has loved us with his perfect sacrificial love. It's a love that always costs something. And today we're looking at the power of love. Nothing has the potential to change the world like the love of Jesus. And that's not a trite statement. I believe that with everything in me, God's love can transform us. What our world needs on the fundamental level for those big systematic and structural changes to take place in our society that we so desperately need is for people's hearts to be transformed. Each of us have to be made new from the inside out so that the love of God will slowly filter into everything else and transform the world through us, that we may become as God intended. You can't change things from the outside in when people's hearts are not right. It has to work from the inside out. And I know this in my own life, and I hope and pray that you know it in yours, that Jesus' love can and does change us. It redefines who we are. It gives us identity. And then sometimes rather uncomfortably and sometimes downright painfully, it slowly but surely cultivates us into the likeness of Jesus. And so God's kingdom becomes a reality in us and through us. Love has the most transformational power of anything in the world. And so today we're looking at another one of the most well-known passages about love, perhaps the most famous one. It's a favorite at weddings and it's a beautiful passage, but as beautiful as it is, it's also quite excruciating in many ways because it holds up a picture for us of what love looks like when the tacky hits the tar in the day-to-day -day reality of life. It's easy to think that you're loving, but when you get down to the nitty gritty detail of what that looks like, it's hard not to see how you are falling short. So our passage is 1 Corinthians 13, the love is chapter. But before we get into that, I just wanna give you a little bit of context about what is happening here. Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians as a letter to the church in Corinth that he had planted. So he traveled around from community to community, starting a church and then moving on to plant the next one. And so he kept in touch and he had heard that things were not going all that well in Corinth. Corinth was this bustling port city. It was very multicultural, very cosmopolitan. And the kind of dodgy way of life and different worldly influences had seeped into the church culture there. And there were major issues in the church around factions and leadership and authority and order. It was a little bit of a chaotic mess, to be, to be frank. And it also had um, a whole bunch of sexual immorality going on and infighting and all kinds of drama. So Paul writes to them to try and establish order and to set things in their proper place in the context of the gospel message and the love of Jesus. And so in chapters 9 to 12 of this letter, and again in chapter 14, Paul's writing about orderly worship and correcting a lot of the chaos and the anarchy that's going on there. And then he's, he's basically setting out principles for order and coherence. Chapter 12, it's all about how we are the body of Christ and we have to work together. We need each other. We're all like different parts of the body that have to function in unity. 
And then he ends the, the chapter by speaking about the gifts of the spirit, prophecy and tongues and miracles and all these supernatural things that we should desire and that God wants to give us and how he builds up his church through them. And then he says, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. And then the love chapter begins. Love is the best way. It's the only way for the church and for Christ followers to function. It's the only thing that matters in the end, how we have been loved by God and how we respond to that in the way that we love others. So let's read the chapter together from 1 Corinthians um, chapter 13 from verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I am known in part, then I shall be fully known. Even Then I shall fully know, sorry, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So I'd like to share three thoughts with you about this passage and what it reveals to us. Firstly, love is what matters. Those first few verses are so poetic and beautiful, but they are scathing if you really look at them. Paul's just spoken about spiritual gifts, and now he says, you can speak with all kinds of tongues. You can prophesy till you're blue in the face. You can have the kind of faith that makes mountains move. And I mean, that's impressive faith. You can even live with extreme generosity. You can give away everything you have. You can even give up your life for the sake of faith. But if you don't have love, it's all a waste of time. It's empty. It's a show. If you have all the things that look like the makings of incredible faith on the outside, but you don't have the love on the inside, it's an empty farce. It's just noise and hot air. Your spirituality and in fact your life is empty without love. If you're not motivated by love, if you're not rooted in and living out of a place of love, we have nothing. We are nothing. Nothing we do matters, no matter how good or spiritual it may seem, if we don't do it in love. And it's a bit of a terrifying thought. I don't know about you, but that kind of stirs up a little bit of concern in my heart. As the message paraphrase puts it, so no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I am bankrupt without love. We better sit up and take notice here because Paul says if we miss this, We've lost the plot entirely. This is the, the crux of the whole matter. Love is the thing that matters above everything else. We all want our lives to matter. We want our work and our effort and our energy to matter. We want our pain to matter. And it can and it does when we are rooted in the love of Jesus. When we let that be our driving force. So love matters. Secondly, love is the standard. In the passage we looked at last week from John chapter 15 and also in John chapter 13, Jesus gives his disciples the command to love others as they have been loved by him. Jesus establishes himself as the standard for love 
and the way that we should evaluate ourselves if we are going to be Jesus followers. If you're going to participate in his kingdom, loving like him is the most important thing. And just before his crucifixion, Jesus gathered his disciples together and he gave them this new commandment. And commandments were a big deal for them. They understood from their Jewish tradition that commandments are like written in stone, given from God. And he'd already summarized all the law and the prophets. And he said, he'd summed it up in two things, love God and love others as yourself. But then he gives a new commandment. And he says this in, in John chapter 13. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, this command wasn't actually new because he'd already said, love others, love God. But what was new was the quality or the nature of the love that he was requiring. It wasn't just love your neighbor. It was love as I have loved you. And I think what that meant hadn't really become clear to the disciples yet because they'd been with Jesus and walked with him and seen how he loved people and called people and journeyed with them and the kind of people he related to. But they hadn't yet experienced the cross and the resurrection. But we look at that command knowing full well what came next, the horror and the beauty of the death of Jesus for us. And so as Andy Stanley puts it, Jesus sets himself up as the standard for what love looks like. And this is the standard every Christ follower should emulate. He says, in fact, this is how his followers will be identified by the way in which they love. So this is something that is really something powerful to strive for. And it's also such a point of pain because we know how far we fall short. And as the church and as the people of God, we are known for many things. But far too often, love is not one of them. But love is the standard that Jesus sets for us. And the good news is that this love is not something that comes from us. It's not something I have to manufacture for myself. It is agape, that perfect sacrificial love with which God loves us. And it comes to us only by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to choose it. We have to keep choosing to connect with God and to live in that love. But then it comes from the work of the Holy Spirit within us. The Amplified Translation of 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 says, If I can speak in the tongues of men and even angels, but I have not love, and then in brackets, that reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as inspired by God's love for and in us, I'm only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And I love that clarity because the kind of love we're talking about here is reasoned, intentional choice of spiritual devotion that says, yes, I will choose to stay connected to God. I will abide in him, like we said last week. I know it's going to cost me something, but I will choose to allow God to change my heart and to give me his love for others because I know that I know that I am loved by him. And then this love can flow through me as a vessel and as a channel and create something bigger and more powerful and more beautiful than I can create on my own. So love matters and love is the standard that is set for us by Jesus. And thirdly, love is action. That's where our passage gets really practical because it breaks down for us what love looks like out there in the world in our day-to-day -day lives. Andy Stanley recently wrote an excellent book that I can really recommend um, to you or bonus if you don't want to buy the book. You can go and just watch his last sermon series and just Google North Point Church Sermons. And it's a, a sermon series called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And it's really brilliant. It's like a decision making matrix for your life. Um, and I think we might do it as a small group series really soon because it's really profound. But he presents these five questions to consider when you're making decisions. And the last one, I think, sums up this whole concept of love in action so beautifully. Because he says we have to ask ourselves, what does love require of me? And that's a hard question. The other questions he says, you know, about good decision making always have a return on investment because if I choose to make good decisions, it's going to benefit me. It's going to make my life better. But this one requires that I look beyond myself and think about how it may not necessarily make my life better, but it's going to make the world better. There isn't always a return on investment in this one because sometimes love just costs me, but it may change the world. 
And so when we make decisions, we've got to go through our lives and continue to ask, what does love require of me? Something may not necessarily be wrong. It may be permissible. It may be prudent even. And we should consider all of those things. But then we should ask, what does love require? And that takes us back to 1 Corinthians 13 because it puts legs on that for us in some ways. It shows us how love manifests in different moments and situations. We know that God is love, but this passage breaks down or extrapolates for us these aspects of God's character that make up what that love is all about. And so maybe for you right now, what love requires is patience, because love is patient. And I'm like, did Paul really have to start with patience? Could he not have like built up to that? Because it's very easy to say, yes, I'm loving, until you ask me how patient I'm being right now, until you get on my nerves and I snap at you. If love looks like patience, am I really loving? And patience is actually a bit of a feeble word because um, the older translations of the Bible use the word long-suffering or forbearance. And this goes right back to the heart of God's character. The most quoted verse in scripture from scripture, so in other words, the sort of the one that most biblical authors refer to and is quoted most often is Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. And the first part of it says, the Lord passed before him, that's Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That patience that is required here is not just putting up with a long queue or a traffic jam or an annoying colleague or a call center agent. It's about patiently enduring injury and trouble and provocation. It's about being willing to forgive and come back again. It's about being realistic about people's failures and flaws and loving them anyway. It's about holding on. It's about loving with that enduring, endless, patient love with which God loves. And that is so central to his character and his nature. Love is patient. Maybe what love requires of you right now is kindness. And a little bit of kindness can go a long way. And you can never go wrong with kindness, especially at the moment. I feel like people are maxed out on uncertainty and fear and stress. And so just respond with kindness. Unnecessary, unwarranted, going out of the way kind of kindness. If you dig a bit deeper into the Greek word that Paul used here, it means to show yourself useful or to act benevolently. It's about just doing good things, being gentle, being considerate, caring about people, responding gently, reacting to people carefully. Love is kind. By contrast, then, Paul tells us two things that love is not. It is not envy. It doesn't boast. It isn't proud. And perhaps what love requires of you right now is to stop doing some things. Stop with the woe is me, my life is so unfair, they have it so much better, the grass is so much greener. Stop with the, the envy, don't resent what other people have, don't begrudge other success or good fortune. Trust that God has got you and worry less about what everyone else has or doesn't have. And in the same vein, if you happen to be on the good side of things for a change, don't boast don't be proud or puffed up. And I love that image. It's, it sounds to me like a peacock that's strutting around with its feathers out thinking it's cool or something that's inflated, but actually only because it's full of hot air. The Amplified Translation says, love endures long and is patient and kind. Love is never envious or boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious. It doesn't display itself haughtily. Maybe what love requires of you right now is humility and to be just make the choice to be content. Love doesn't dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. And maybe what love requires of you right now is to think the best and to speak the best of others. We're all flawed and heaven knows. And I think, you know, in this stressful time that we, we find ourselves in, um, the cracks kind of are very exposed, perhaps more than usual. And so maybe love requires of us to keep saying the best and believing the best about others, to us, to them, to ourselves, to other people. Maybe it requires being extra considerate instead of self-interested. And that's hard in a crisis because people tend to become insular and self-protective when they're afraid and there are threats. But love calls us to be different, to put others first, to be irrationally generous, 
to go above and beyond, to be considerate and to do for others even what they would never do for us. Love is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. I don't know about you, but I'm finding this one a little bit more difficult than usual at the moment because I feel like my fuse is short. <laughs> my emotional energy reserves are not very full. And so it doesn't take much to push me over the edge. Um, to be, Amen. To, <laughs> you see, you see. I don't know if you can hear him, but he's being rude. Um, to be truthful, I had a pretty um, bad moment the other day when I completely snapped about something really stupid. Cray phoned me and told me about something that was going on. I just completely lost it. Um, and at, at another time, maybe I would have... <laughs> Now he's being very rude. Um, I'm just telling you how short my fuse is. Now you're provoking me. You see what I have to live with? No, I, um, I, he craved for me about something. And I think at a different time, I would just have been like, oh, yeah, whatever. Kind of, you know, laugh it off um, or not really get irritated by it. But I just completely, I sort of had this out of body experience where I could just feel this anger rising up in me. And I was totally, I like shouted, luckily only at Cray and not at the person who was involved. Um, but I could kind of just imagine Cray's face on the other side of the phone going like, whoa, that was a slightly disproportional reaction to what just happened. Um, but, but love requires of us that we don't actually let our fuses get the better of us. It requires us to drink deep of the endless supply of God's love and his protection and his filling and his fulfillment so that our reserves don't catch up with us and we end up flying off the handle. Love is controlled and it's gentle, and it doesn't hold a grudge or get fed up. The Amplified again says, it is not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and doesn't act unbecomingly. God's love does not insist on its own rights or own way. It is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. And that stings a bit because I feel like I've been all those things. I know that I have been touchy and fretful and resentful. But God can and will empower me, empower us, if we let him to be different and to allow his love to help us respond differently. And so I'm trying to see these things in my life as warning lights. You know, if you recognize them in yourself, don't beat yourself up and go into a tailspin of condemnation and shame. Let them convict your heart and be like warning lights on the dashboard of your life that go, hold on, something is not right here. I'm running out of fuel, and so I'm reacting badly. So what am I going to do about that? How am I going to refuel myself? Or maybe something is broken here that I need to fix. Maybe my spiritual oil, so to speak, needs to be changed. Maybe there's muck in my filter that I need to clean out so that I can run better. God's grace is sufficient for us now and always to live out his love if we'll let him teach us and change us. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And so maybe what love requires of you today is to really fight for and delight in the truth, to resist untruths and half-truths, to focus on what is real and good and eternally true. Maybe it requires of you to be really honest with yourself or others. Maybe it requires you to stand up for what is just and right. Love always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Maybe what love requires of you right now is to trust God or others. Maybe it requires that you hold on to hope, that you endure and persevere and don't give up. So I'm going to leave three questions with you this week that I hope will just be mulling through your, your thoughts and sitting on your heart this week as you go into what lies ahead for you. The first question is, am I living a life that matters because it is rooted in love. And what I'm doing, is what I'm doing really mattering because I'm doing it in love? The second question is, how am I doing in terms of emulating the standard of love that is set by Jesus? And thirdly, what does love require of me right now? These three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, is love. Let's pray together. Father God, we are overwhelmed with the love that you give us. Your endless, never-ending, perfect, long-suffering love. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would pour it out into us, that we may live it out in the world. Lord Jesus, help us to see what love requires of us, to emulate you in the way that we engage with others in the world. 
May our lives matter because they are rooted first and foremost in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.